Where's the so right. what am I looking for? Apply. Welcome everybody out there in Zoom land. We'll be getting started in a few short minutes, just having people filter in to the live programming here at the library. So hang on and uh, sit tight and we'll be joining you soon. Thanks. Okay, welcome everybody to our first Lust Hills Wild Ones meeting in person for 2023. My name is Dawn Snyder. I'm one of the co-presidents of our local chapter, the Lust Hills Wild Ones. So glad to see some people here in person. And also we've got folks on Zoom. Um, we are hoping that you can see us. Give us a thumbs up there on, on Zoom if you happen to uh, if you can see us um, and see this slide, <laughs> I've got yeah. um, great. Thank you. With uh, with us in the um, room, uh, we have our Les Hills Wild Ones board. Uh, Co-president is Ruth Rose, and we also have our treasurer Marcy Ponder, and uh, she's also going to be sharing more about the grants in a little bit. Um, and we also have Danielle Metzger here. She is with um, uh, our very important tech person and also secretary, <laughs> and Tom and uh, Sherry Stewart are co-vice presidents, um, and they're coordinating the plant sale. So we're hoping that you'll get uh, fine today interesting and give you some food for thought for some of the plants. There's some new species that we're offering this uh, spring for our spring sale that we're hoping you'll enjoy um, and uh, perhaps consider in your yard, depending on what you're doing. So without further ado, I'm going to start meeting the plants and rolling out of the grants. Um, first of all, a little bit more about when the plant sale will be. It will be on Friday, May 19th um, for Lust Hills Wild Ones members only. If you're not currently a member, 
no fear. That can easily be solved by going on uh, the website lusthillswildwinds.org. And Ruth has a QR code in the back of the room. Um, and uh, Wild Ones is a national organization, and we are one of the we are the first chapter in Iowa, and there's uh, growing chapters throughout the nation. So basically, we uh, serve to try to promote putting native plants on the landscape to um, help with the uh, longevity of the species. And uh, obviously, native plants are going to thrive and do better in the climate that you're around and that you're in. So having, having those um, longer-lived species of native plants is also going to be attracting native pollinators and uh birds and butterflies and wildlife and uh, overall helping to um, create a better ecosystem in your natural world here. So we're hopeful that uh, you'll consider some native plants. We're not saying you have to plant all native plants and maybe you're, it's not going to work for you, but we're hoping that uh, you'll find some great um, ideas today. Um, for the public sale, it's going to be on Saturday, May 20th and Sunday, May 21st. It's going to be in Sioux City here and, and we held um, at Tom and Sherry Stewart's home over in the Morningside area. Um, the plants that we're going to be getting for uh, sale, and this is an in-person sale only as far as we're not pre-ordering, show up and the plants will be there. Pick out which ones you like and pay and go home. Put them in the ground. So that's our, that's our plan. We did that last fall. It worked out really well. So Agricol is our uh, plant supplier for our wildflowers. And we also are offering some trees and shrubs this year. And they're from the... Uh, State Forest Nursery in Ames. So a uh, little bit about planning and, and considering um, before you, you decide what you're going to plant, um, knowing where you live. And here in Iowa, we are in the Great Plains region. Um, so looking at the eco regions and zones, also planting zones, there's so much available in books and online about um, planning. And I know many of you are master gardeners, or you might be interested in becoming a master gardener, or you just really love plants or you're like me and there's a hole and I'm gonna put a plant in it and hope it, hope it lives. You know? <laughs> I, I don't have a green thumb, I love plants, but um, if they're inside, they don't have a fighting chance usually, but outside they do better. So another source at the top of the page is the North American Plant Atlas, with, which is also known as BONAP. And that will give you a little bit more information on, um, it's pretty a technical site, but it gives you where plants, um, what species are found and which, um, which states throughout all of North America. So a little bit about that. I'm not going to belabor the point. I'm going to start right away with our flashiest flower, I think, out there that, that we're offering. And it's just beneficial in so many ways because of um, a beautiful orange, bright flower, the butterfly milkweed. And I grew up on a farm and I spent hours pulling and hoeing and digging common milkweed out of my dad's soybean fields. So milkweed to some people that maybe grew up at a farm area might be a bad word, but we've learned that milkweed's not a bad word. It's essential and important for the monarch butterflies. And this is one of those that I can't, I can't imagine anybody wanting to dig this plant up because it's fantastic. Um, and it not only does it attract so many different species of uh, butterflies um, for nectar sources and hummingbirds and bees, um, it also is essential for our native monarch butterflies. Um, and but monarchs use this as a host plant, not just a common milkweed, but all the types of milkweeds that we have throughout North America. So um, I wanted to share a little bit about the photos in this. Um, Diane Blankenship is a emeritus member and she has done this program for many, many years. Many of the photos are from Diane. We also have other contributors for the photos, including um, I've tried to do my best to acknowledge all those. Prairie Moon Nursery, we've used several of those, as well as photos from the Minnesota wildflowers. And if you see a little copyright in the corner, that's where those are from, um, as well as others. So thanks all for the collaboration and assistance. The other neat thing about this plant is not only is it beautiful, but it's heat re and drought resistant and it'll bloom for months. From June even into October, I had mine blooming. Um, and like every milkweed, it has the pod with the fluffy seeds. So um, Linda and Robert Scarth um, did some beautiful artistic photos. And just look how gorgeous it is with that blazing star, the purple and the orange together. Um, again, uh, more photos from Diane's beautiful garden and, and, and uh, showing more at nightfall with the Menzelia, which is an endangered rare plant in our area and showing how um, it can really accent other flowers. 
um, along her road, her driveway with um, some of the dotted spotted bee ball, which is another plant we're showcasing today, and in remnant prairies. And of course, there's that. What kind of caterpillar is it? <laughs> it's a young, it's a it's on a young butterfly milkweed. And sometimes a big fat caterpillar like that could decimate your milkweed. So um, but yeah, that one's gonna metamorphose pretty soon. So there's a little bit about our butterfly milkweed. We have a second milkweed that we're sharing, and this one's new to us this year that we're offering, the spider milkweed, and it's really a cool plant. Um, again, it attracts lots of butterflies, bees, wasps, and beetles, a host for monarchs. It's really a dry, tolerant species, more sandy and dry prairies, pastures. Um, it does not like to have other plants right next to it, so if you have some open space for low competition, you can consider putting it there. Um, you also want to think about this plant um, because it, it uh, doesn't spread that much. So it's nice to have um, if you're looking at it for a, a smaller garden area. Love the colors with that in, internal kind of a rosy white pink flower with the green on the outside. Um, another name for it is green antelope horn. And it does show on the bone app that it's not found in Iowa, but it's located all around us and in, in Nebraska and south and and, and also in Illinois. So um, because we're kind of changing with our climate and whatnot, it, it's kind of on the edge ar around us. So 12 inches tall is all this little uh, plant is. So and many times it just has a single bloom per, per stalk. So that's a little bit about the spider milkweed that you might want to consider. Heath aster is our third plant we're sharing. And uh, heath aster is one of those plants um, here in our native Lust Hills Prairie. If you're out in August and into September and October, this is one of our very prevalent little white asters. And they're just beautiful little lacy, delicate flowers. It is a magnet to all sorts of pollinators and uh, definitely a great nectar source for those um, late late fall insects as well. The pearl crescent butterfly, which is uh, I think pictured in one of the slides coming up, is it's a host plant for that, um, that species of butterfly. I want to say that it, it does have some pretty big rhizomes. It does self-seed and it could be aggressive. So think about where you might want to put it. Um, but again, in a native prairie, lots of other grasses and other things around. I've never seen it be aggressive, but in your own garden, it might become that way. So keep that in mind because um, it could spread up to a foot per year. It's also called white heath aster and those rays of flowers, look at all those insects on there. Um, they're really, really a, a beautiful, beautiful addition and uh, it might kind of droop at times. So think about that. So a couple feet tall, um, full or partial sun, and look how it really pops against that little blue stem. It's really gorgeous. And there's another, I guess I didn't have the picture of the butterfly, but I just wanted to uh, also let you know that this is deer resistant. So that's another plus. <laughs> so if you have deer, like oh, I have deer, not so many. I know I don't have as much deer as you do, Tom and Sherry, but, <laughs> but lots of deer. Um, another new one, I believe, to our sale is Bone Set. Some of you may be familiar with false bone set, but this is a different species, Eupatorium. Um, and also the false bone set will have alternate leaf arrangement, whereas the regular bone set, which is this one, the leaves are opposite from each other. And you can kind of see there in the uh, middle, forget about my little mousy thing, the kind of in the way they come together, it almost looks like they're surrounding the base. The leaves are kind of basal and joined around there. Um, it does, it's more of a wet, likes its feet wet. Um, it, it adapts to those wetter areas. Um, and uh, if you might want to keep that in mind, we have um, lots of different insect species that do enjoy the bone set. It will get two to five feet tall though. So it can get pretty, pretty tall. So you need to have a lot of space for this and, uh, Think about it as a background and a, um, maybe on the back of the border, if, excuse me, if you have that type of um, structure, it could be a good structure plant as well. It needs full sun. And again, it likes the wet to wet mesic soils. Um, there's a type of, I believe, fritillary on that plant. 
Okay, talk about some earlier spring bloomers. Um, the wild geranium is um, a great nectar source for bumblebees and native bees. It's important for those early pollinators. And uh, we have, um, it, it, the one thing about this is not deer resistant. I've tried to plant it a few times and guess what? It hasn't come back because the deer got it or the bunnies got it. Um, so uh, keep that in mind. You might wanna try to protect it. So once it can get going, it'll do well. And also, if you think about a spring ephemeral, uh, a native wildflower in the woodlands, spring ephemerals will bloom and come up before there's a lot of shade um, underneath those big trees. So it needs some dappled sunlight, um, some filtered sunlight. It doesn't, it can be in the shady area or part shade. Um, it uh, tolerates the full sun there too, but it, it it says it's one of the easiest ones to grow if the deer does not, if the deer don't get it. So uh, really a beautiful, lovely little plant and also could be considered as a ground cover. So um, keep that in mind because it has some neat, neat uh, pattern on the leaves, really a beautiful flower. And this one has some added benefits. The wild strawberry can consider that also as a garden uh, ground cover. And I planted um, wild strawberry for, for cover in my backyard a couple of years ago, and it's just thriving where it is. I need to, I need to separate it and move it because, and move it around and cover more of the ground. <laughs> the other thing is that it's a, it's a double one. It's great for, um, certainly for pollinators and for, but it also produces that tasty, very tiny little strawberry to eat. So um, keep that in mind if you wanna have, I love to have edibles. Um, it's gonna take a lot of little strawberries to, to put on a strawberry shortcake, but pretty much I let the birds get them because I'm not out there or I see it there and I might nibble on one and two, one or two of them, but they will spread by runners or stolons. And that's a host for the gray hair streak. Um, this I love this photo because it shows kind of the raised bed with the runners. Um, so you can consider that if you wanted to have it a ground cover on one of your raised beds or along the edge of I have a retaining wall in the back of my yard that I might consider having it grow up in there. Um, so that's another one that's the uh, wild strawberry. And it's a lot of fun to uh, have those in your yard. Okay, the pale leaf sunflower is um, a pretty beautiful uh, sunflower that's more uh, later in the summer, gonna be blooming in July through August. It's also known as the woodland sunflower, which makes sense because to me, when I looked at it, I'm like, that looks like the woodland sunflower that I see in Stone Park in the fall, because that's what it is. I didn't realize the name was pale leaf sunflower also. Um, Helianthus stromosus. So, um, they have the yellow centers and the be beautiful yellow. I don't know if you can see that little tiny crab spider hiding behind there on the, uh, on the back side of the flower there. Um, it is new to our sale. It blooms, like I said, later in the summer, one to three feet tall. Um, sunflowers can hybridize, so they also are tricky to identify. That's another reason why it's hard to figure out what's what. I've seen them out in the wild higher than three feet maybe. So keep that in mind. It, it can be, again, because of those vigorous rhizomes, it could spread. Um, and you want to keep a close account on this one if you, if you don't have a lot of room for it. So keep that in mind. Um, and again, thanks again to the Minnesota Wildflowers and uh, for those photographers that we were able to use. Um, this is one of my favorites as well. I love the purple, the rough blazing star, um, and it can get pretty tall. Just look at that. On that image alone, we've got the black swallowtail. We have a soldier beetle. Well, our black swallowtail, soldier beetle. We have like a lace wing up in here. We've got this beetle, we've got another beetle, but there's just a plethora of insects right on there for pollinators. So it's 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 a magnet. And uh, besides being beautiful and adding structure, if you're thinking about in the winter months or um, I have several of these in my garden and they're still standing now and I, they give structure and beauty to my garden until my dog mounds them over. <laughs> but uh, they uh, are really are a great plant. Um, all of the Leatris or the Blazing Stars, in my opinion, are top-notch. 
And it'll bloom August to October, one to three feet tall, once full sun. And this is my cover slide that I used from Prairie Moon Nursery. I love that. Look at, wouldn't it be great to have that many in? <laughs> just look at that every, every uh, summer. It's just a beautiful plant. And again, the, um, the pollinators really love it. It's important and vital for those late fall, um, late summer um, butterflies like the monarchs that are migrating to get a nectar source. And this is a, a sulfur that's on here. That's a nice photo that Rod Tondru, who is a local plant, Les Hills Wild Ones member, and um, also a botanist and professor at Western Iowa Tech. Okay, another pretty purple blue one, the great blue lobelia. We've, we've offered this in the past and it, it's for good reason because it's a great, great plant. Um, nectar source for butterflies, also the hawk moths or the sphinx moths and hummingbirds. And uh, we have a few, few moths also that need to have it for a host plant. The other good plus on this, it's a deer resistant. So another good one. Um, I would kind of back up just a little bit with the, the blazing star. They're not necessarily as deer resistant. So you want to, or rabbit resistant, you want to protect them when they're little, but once they get going, they'll be, they'll be fine. Um, so the lobelia likes their feet wet as well, a little bit in the moist so soil. Um, but they will adapt pretty well. Um, this is a photo of one in the natural prairie near Spencer from the flower, the prairie flower, which is a, a neat place to visit if you've never been there. Um, some other ones that are shared from Minnesota wildflowers look, show what they look like maybe in the wild. Um, and then uh, just gorgeous. You can imagine the bumblebees with their fat, big bodies can get inside there and get into that nectar and really do a great job to... Uh, to uh, find the nectar and also get full of pollen to go to a next plant. And I love this one too. Thanks Ruth Rose for sharing this with how, how beautiful is that with the different colors with the blue lobelia and the orange butterfly milkweed and the yellow sneezeweed. And it's just really a spectacular mix right here at the flower house here in Sioux City. So um, nice. Now the cardinal flower is a close relative to the great lobelia great blue lobelia. There are very, very few flowers that are red, um, naturally red. And this is one of them. The cardinal flower does like it in a wet, wet or moisture area as well. Similar for pollinators as the lobe blue lobelia. Again, um, there's going to be a host plant. It's also deer resistant and just stunning pops of red um, in, the, in the garden. I... Had a few, and I think I think the bunnies chewed them when they were little. So got to keep working on that. But it's going to be on the sale this year, so I'm going to buy some more and keep working. The other cool thing is hummingbirds. Who can't who can't resist a hummingbird? And they love to visit this flower. And uh, I'm really grateful for this photo as well that Diane secured from um, Tom Scherer, and it was on one of our past holiday cards. Isn't that pretty with all the dew on the cardinal flower? So that takes us to. Our next plant that I'm gonna turn over the reins to Sherry. She's gonna share about uh, the next several plants. So welcome Sherry Stewart, our co-vice president. Here. You don't think the lights like this? You wanna turn down at all? It's over by Yep. Good. Sorry, I shouldn't have done that. I can't. I can't read. Yeah. <laughs> can't see. I'm good. Yeah. No, you can go one more. Okay. Okay. I'm happy now. Okay. <laughs> okay. Spotted bee balm has been on our sales before, but it is such a cool plant that we just had to have it again. Um, it has these unusual pagoda-looking flowers that are pink and purple and green and white and beige, and they also make wonderful cut flowers. It likes sandy soil or a looser soil, less soil it does quite well in, and it likes full to partial sun. It is quite drought resistant and it reaches a height of about two feet. It blooms uh, July through August. Let me see, I could probably go on to the next flower here. Up close, isn't that beautiful? 
It's a short-lived perennial. It can become aggressive. I can't believe that, but it says in an optimum environment, it can. And it uh, has a noticeable fragrance that deer and rabbit don't like. That's another picture. It smells kind of like an oregano. If you water it, it can prolong the, the blooms. So I'm gonna go back one more as to that. Um, it attracts bees and butterflies and other beneficial insects. And it's a host plant to nine butterflies and moths, including the raspberry parosta butterfly. Okay, go on to lion's foot. I'm excited about this one. This is a new plant to our sale and it's named because of the shape of its leaf that looks kind of like a, a lion's foot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, use your imagination, that's right. The long central stem ends in a panicle of pale green buds. Whoops, that's all we had on that one. Let me go back one more, there we go. Um, pale green buds that open early in the summer and in, open into white, rose, and purple tubular flowers throughout the fall. Finally, those seeds burst open into a coppery pappus, kind of like the bloom of the, um, uh, oh, around the dandelion, um, that resembles a lion's mane. So maybe it should be called lion's mane instead of lion's foot. But it's happy in light shade and medium moist soil. And in the optimum conditions, it can grow to about four feet tall. Uh, native bees, beetles, and moths frequent this plant. Okay, our next one up is wild golden glow, and we might want to emphasize wild on this. It is a woodland plant. However, like unlike most woodland plants, it has a relatively uh, late bloom time. Most woodland plants are spring bloomers, and this one blooms more August through October. It likes moist ground and light shade, and it can reach heights of over seven feet tall, but it can tolerate full sun and shade. And I will testify that it can tolerate full sun because we had it in our garden um, in full sun. It spreads by rhizomes and can be aggressive. So it may not be suitable for small gardens. Has anybody seen the movie Doom? You remember that? It was years ago and it had these great big worms that went up and down the sand dunes. That's the rhizomes of this plant. I call it the sandworm plant because we've been pulling. And if anybody's been to our garden, you know it's a fairly large space. So we've been moving it down into the pasture closer to the woods and stuff because it is aggressive. So if you have a small garden, I would not suggest it. If you have a large woodland area, this is just perfect for you because it's going to be attracting bees and butterflies and the seed heads will feed the birds all winter long and it is deer resistant. There's another picture of it. Pretty little flower with those green centers. Okay, early figwort. This is another new plant to our sale, and it might appear weedy to some people, including your neighbors. It has small, unimpressive reddish-brown flowers, but wait for it. It produces abundant nectar and attracts a wide range of pollinators. It blooms May through June, and it's really important for the hummingbirds as they're coming through um, on their spring migration. So if you hate cleaning out the dead ants from your hummingbird feeders, plant this plant and you won't have to worry about putting a hummingbird feeder up in your yard. It um, prefers light shade, but it can tolerate shade and full sun. Uh, the full sun, as long as it has uh, vegetation around its roots to keep them cool. It's tolerant of medium wet to dry soils, and in optimum conditions, it can reach heights of six feet. It's deer resistant. 
Um, we also have in our next sale, hopefully, uh, a late figwort coming that blooms in the fall. Okay, so the next one up is going to be goldenrod, and it is one of our keystone species. And if you don't know what a keystone species is, I'm going to read something from this book by Doug Tallamy. Um, one of the most important things that a native plant can do is be a host to caterpillars or food for caterpillars. Um, but all native plants aren't created equal. As uh, Talame says, native plants themselves vary by orders of magnitude in their ability to host caterpillars. But wherever we've looked, about 5% of the local plant genre hosts 70 to 75% of the local caterpillar species. So 5% of the, the population of native plants does most of the work. Um, and he says, I refer to these hyperproductive plants as keystone plants. Without them, the food web all but falls apart. So this is the golden rod that we're offering um, on this sale. It's called Riddell's golden rod. And its mounded flowers are lemony yellow turning to a ruddy red in the late fall. As it blooms, the leaves might wither up and dry, uh, fall off and uh, leave those yellow or ruddy red seed heads bobbing around kind of on the naked stems, which kind of can be a, a kind of a, a cool look too. Um, but if you want to remember that and plant other things around it, um, the leaves themselves are distinct. They overlap one another. I don't think I have a great picture of that, but they give kind of a braided look going up the stem. Um, it requires full sun and it likes wet to moist soil. So in my garden on a, in a, uh, another season like we had last year, I might be out there watering it. Uh, but in optimum conditions, it grows about three feet tall. Its flowers attract a myriad of bees and butterflies. Many moths and caterpillars feed on its leaves, which of course then attracts the birds. In late fall and winter, the seeds are also a bird magnet and they are deer resistant. Just gonna read you a little thing about what uh, Doug Ptolemy has to say about goldenrod. Out of the chapter, what have weeds done for us lately? Um, my wife is the weeder in Ptolemy land. Like so many of us, she enjoys orderly landscapes and prefers that our plants grow only in their designated spaces. Yet she also understands that the animals in our yard depend on our native plant communities. The other day she came in from the yard and said, I know goldenrod supports a lot of species, but what specifically would suffer if I just weeded some out? Well, let's see, I said, goldenrod leaves support 110 species of caterpillars in Southeast Pennsylvania and many species of leaf beetles and June beetles. In our area, its flowers produce pollen and nectar for 35 bee species, 15 of which can only use goldenrod pollen. Myriad wasps, as well as longhorned, scarab, blister, phallocrid, and ladybird beetles. And don't forget that goldenrod nectar is an important source of energy for migrating monarchs. Goldenrod flowers are favorite hunting sites for crab spiders and praying mantids and its seeds feed a number of wintering sparrows, juncos, and finches. Birds use them to line their nests in the spring. Its stem provides housing for native bees, both during the summer and winter, and support four species of gallers, as well as several stem-borne caterpillars, and they're feeding sites for many plant and leaf hoppers. Who knows how many species goldenrod roots support? Hmm, she said, I'll leave as much as I can. Before returning to the garden, she looked back at me and said, I wish more people knew this. You should tell them. <laughs> <laughs> so goldenrod is one of those really, really important plants. If you're going to plant one perennial, I guess I'd say plant a goldenrod. Look at that. that they are just gorgeous flowers. 
Okay, then we come to um, common ironweed. Um, I love ironweed. It is one of those uh, strong vertical lines in the garden. So many of our, our plants are like in that three to four foot range and they're kind of shrubby and round. The ironweed just stands up there like a, like a beacon. So if you plant like groupings of this ironweed up and down the paths, it just draws your line, just kind of like a guidepost. They're just gorgeous. Um, the flowers form a brilliant purple cluster. They bloom July, August, and September, and they thrive in moist soils and full to partial sun. These last couple of years, I have had to water my ironweed because it was getting, it was surviving, but it certainly wasn't thriving. It attracts native bees and butterflies, and it's a host plant for the American Painted Lady. It is deer resistant. Gorgeous. Okay, lead plants. Lead, lead plants. Let me see. Oops. Lead plant has delicate looking silver foliage and bright purple tubular blossoms with orange stamens. I think that you can see those orange stamens there. So pretty. There's a better picture. The bloom time is June through August. It takes a few years for this plant to mature. So um, just be patient, it will be worth it. Um, it thrives in full sun, but it can survive in part shade and it's happy in any dry to medium soil. Uh, anything from sand to clay. Above ground, it reaches three feet tall but it sends down deep roots reaching depths of 15 feet. The settlers that tried to plow it called it devil's shoestrings. It attracts a bunch of beneficial insects and it's the larval host for the dog face sulfur. Once established, it's deer and rabbit resistant, but until then it may need some protection. What we're, our garden is three years old and it still needs protected, I can tell you that. That's so pretty, that's in Diane's Prairie. It's just gorgeous. Okay, then lead plant. What, what did I? There's I several, know. there's several. Books. Oh, okay, there we go. You put a lot of those in there, okay. Isn't that that? The foliage is so pretty. This little thing is up here in the corner hiding the next slide. Oh. Sorry, I can do it without. Stream too. Mm -hmm. Okay, there we go. Okay. So, oh, okay. See so, that. That looks good. Yeah, too far. Okay. Oh, yep, yeah, you're ready. Sorry. Okay. 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 Wild lupine. Uh, lupines are legumes. Um, that means that they harbor beneficial in or bacteria in their roots, which means they can take nitrogen out of the atmosphere and fix it into the soil. And that improves the health of the entire plant community that it's living in. Its leaves. Do we have a picture of our leaves? Yeah, its leaves are um, palm shaped and, and very attractive. However, they do start to look a little tired later in the season. So again, you might want to plant something around that plant. And one of the things that they do suggest is June grass, which we'll be getting to pretty quick. It's so pretty. Um, the blue and purple, See if I can go back to the blue and purple pea like flowers bloom on short stalks called racemes through May through July. And one plant sends up multiple stalks. They prefer uh, full to partial sun and medium to medium dry soil and grow to about two feet tall. That includes the, the stalk, uh, the flower stalk. I would say without the flower stalk, the plant's probably under a foot. 
Uh, it's attractive to many pollinators and it's the only host plant to the endangered Carner blue butterfly, which does not live in our area. It's more over in the uh, Great Lakes region. So if you have friends over there, let them know. <laughs> It is not listed as deer and rabbit resistant and prairie moon, but it hasn't been bothered in, in our garden, which is unheard of because they try most of the plants in our garden. So that I will say yet, it has not been bothered. That's a beautiful butterfly. Okay, goat's rue. Let's see if I can find goat's rue. This is also known as wild sweet pea, and it's another new plant to our sale, which I'm really excited about. I love yellow and pink together, so that just to me is a, a gorgeous flower. It's also a legume, so it also fixes the nitrogen. Um, it has bicolored flowers that look like a sweet pea. The two lower petals are pink, uh, and the upper petal is a pale yellow. The bloom time is June through July. The stems and leaves are covered in soft white hair, so it gives the foliage a, a silvery look, and it only grows 12 inches tall, so it's going to be a good front-of-the-border plant. Um, it thrives in moderately dry soil and a sunny spot, but make sure you plant it where you want it to be because it sends down a long taproot so it does not like to be transplanted. Uh, it has distinctive hairy two inch long sea pods. It attracts ground birds and it is deer resistant. As one warning, this is a poisonous plant. It's been used as an insecticide and it is toxic to fish. The Native Americans um, used to grind the plant and spread it on the, the water so the fish would come to the surface. So this may not be one that you would plant around your pond. Okay, this is June grass, the one that I said you might want to consider planting around your, uh, what did I say? Um, um, oh, help me out. Thank you, wild blue pine. <laughs> yeah. um, it is an attractive little grass, gray green in color and silvery green seeds. It grows uh, quickly in the cooler temperatures of spring and fall. Uh, it grows about two feet tall, but that includes the seed heads. The blades of the grass are really only about six inches long. It prefers full to partial sun and thrives in loose or sandy soil. It refuses to grow in clay. It attracts a lot of wildlife, including birds for nesting materials, bees for its structure, and deer for the food. So if you're going to grow that, I have it around a young oak tree and, and it's all uh, fenced off. So we'll see what happens as it gets older. Okay. There you go. Hello, I'm Ruth and I am getting addicted to native plants. <laughs> this is the prairie drop seed. This grass prefers a really hot, dry condition where it can soak up the sun, but it will grow in almost any soil. Okay, how do I make it go? I froze the screen. Ruth Tech Challenge. <laughs> I am. Oh, yeah. Tech Challenge. <laughs> Awkward <Offer> pause. <laughs> there we go. Oh, good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> 
apparently I'm a klutz creator because I am a klutz in my own life. And uh, I have a dear friend who, if she's around me, I'm not a klutz, but uh, yeah, it's all yours. Oh, good. I can make it go. Okay. Good. Yay. Okay. The seeds of the species, which drop in the fall, are a great food for seed eating birds. The seed heads can smell like cilantro. So if you're a person that cilantro smells like soap, this will actually smell like soap to you. On to our, this is our second goldenrod. And as Sherry very well pointed out, goldenrod is one of the most important species for the fall migration. Zigzag goldenrod has been super popular because this is one of the few goldenrods that tolerates shade and it's a magnet for pollinators. Um, it, goldenrod is one of the plants that gets an undeserved reputation for causing hay fever. It's actually ragweed that causes hay fever and not the goldenrod in the fall. Don took this photograph of the goldenrod in the wild, and it is exactly like this in my backyard. I planted it, what, two years ago, and it looks just exactly like that. On to our fox sedge. Good uses for this sedge in your landscaping projects would be along a pond, a lake, a stream, a ditch, in seasonal flooding spots, or in a rain garden. It tolerates a lot of wet uh, areas. Birds love this sedge as do waterfowl. Caterpillars and other insects feed off the leaves. This photo is actually from the Mount Cuba Center. I don't know if you guys have had a chance to go online. It's mountcubacenter.com, all small case letters. And it is a nature garden in Delaware that uh, it's actually one of the DuPont gardens and it is 100% native plants. So it is really worth seeing. And they have many tours online. Um, I've gotten a lot of ideas for planting off that site. This is the blue wood aster or heart-shaped aster. This plant is new to me personally, and I am going to plant this in the flower house that you saw the picture earlier in a spot that I'm having a lot of trouble with that's a full shade spot. This plant actually says that it is partial shade, but it tolerates full shade and full sun. So I'm gonna try it in that spot. I'll let you know what it does next year at this time, and we'll uh, catch you up on that. This is a beautiful, I have not seen this plant in the wild. This is our aromatic aster, and this is one of my favorite plants. I have this all over all of the properties that I'm caring for. This plant blooms well after the frost into October, and the foliage is super nice all season long, and I actually cut that and put that into flower arrangements when it's just green, because it just makes a beautiful arrangement. And by chopping it back, you get a lower shrubby appearance and a, a more controlled plant. Um, the name aromatic aster is a little bit deceiving because it is not the flower that is aromatic. It is the crushed leaf. So if you get this plant, go ahead and crush the leaf and you'll know what they mean by aromatic aster. The flowers turn reddish purple as they mature and they're an important fall so food source for the monarchs and for all the fall pollinators. And I just love that picture. The stiff stems will be completely covered by flowers when blooming. They pair very well with the goldenrods because the goldenrods come up through the center of these flowers and thick grasses like the little blue stem, big blue stem, if you can plant them, the aromatic asters around those, it's just a framework of beauty. Okay, marsh, rose, red, whatever you decide to call this milkweed. If you have a damp spot in your garden, you really want to put this flower in it. It's absolutely gorgeous. And this is one that I actually counted monarchs. I had more monarch caterpillars on my rose milkweed than on any other milkweeds in the garden. This is a really deer resistant plant. I don't think I've ever seen a deer touch it. It blooms for about six weeks in June, July and August, but not throughout the whole time. It depends on the sun exposure. So during those months it will bloom and you just in different places in my gardens, it blooms at different times of the year. It has fantastically gorgeous seed pods, but if you don't want this plant to spread, take the seed pods off and either give them to your neighbors or throw them in ditches along the road because they will spread. 
Um, it's not aggressive, but it will spread by seeds. Large numbers of these plants can be seen in wetland areas um, in na nature. And as I said, it, it really has not been aggressive in my garden, but I do have a lot of competition in my gardens. It grows up to four feet tall, prefers full sun, and it does not like dry conditions at all. And actually that's on the far right, a picture in my garden of just a sunflower that seeded itself amongst the rose milkweed in there. You can't see it, but there are quite a few monarch caterp caterpillars within that photo. Okay, on to the tall bellflower. This plant is a self-seeding annual or biennial. So the first year it will drop its seeds and make little rosettes on the ground. And then the second year, it sends up this big tall spike and it ranges from three to five feet in height. So you do have to have a little space for this. It's really good in a woodland edge or under oak trees or any, uh, any shady area trees. And I'm actually going to try it this year under fir trees, but I'm not sure that the acid won't be too much for them. And this is that tall spike that shoots up the second year. So you have to watch for the little rosettes on the ground and let them go, don't weed them out. And then the second year, this will spike and seed. Okay, this is Cytos grandma. And this is one of the cutest grasses in fall. I just love this whenever I see it. And I take a lot of photos of this particular um, grass in bloom like this or in seed like it is on the far right there. It's a very distinctive seed and literally you will see it here and there and everywhere. And this plant they recommend, I have not done this myself, for a border plant around spring wildflowers. So I think I will try that this year. This is a large flowered beard tongue. And honestly, there are really no photos that give this plant justice. It is so bright. Literally, when I'm driving down Talbot Road, if I see it, it stops my car. It is just incredible. It reaches up to two feet. It has these stunning, large tubular blooms of pink and pur purple flowers, and it blooms during May and June. It's loved by the bees and by the hummingbirds. And Diane's photo here, she has a little sphinx moth up here, which I, I call a hummingbird moth. Those are one of my favorite little creatures buzzing around the garden. It's earned its name as a showy beard tongue. And this plant is actually endangered in some states and it, in most states actually, and it is not often found in the wild, although we do have it here in the last hills. This is our narrow leaf cone flower. And a fun fact about the narrow leaf cone flower is that in 1805, Lewis and Clark sent Thomas Jefferson samples of it from Fort Mandan. And I hope I'm saying that correctly. Mandan? Mandan. Mandan, which is now South Dakota. No, North Dakota. Thank you. Good. People were listening. That's amazing. <laughs> As its name indicates, the leaves are one and a half to one inches across compared to the two to three inches of the regular purple coneflower. This plant prefers dry soil and full sun. And we have to thank our own Lisa McNeil for this wonderful photo in the wild. And I believe that is a regal fritillary. Um, it's super deer resistant. So this is one that really you can put into a deer area, tracks many pollinators, and it does well in either a naturalized or a very formal setting. It will not take over. And this is our copper-shouldered oval sedge. This is a cool season sedge. It looks fabulous in spring and in fall. And the seed heads are really gorgeous. If you pick them and then tuck them into flower arrangements early before they go into bloom, they'll actually dry and you can use them for the whole year. They're really, really pretty. 
Um, I personally like the idea of the sedge because it's cute name, Bignellii, reminds me of Don's dog, dog Nelly. So I've nicknamed this one the Nelly sedge. It's my new Nelly sedge. Um, you do want to go ahead and leave plenty of those seed heads for the wildlife because both animals and many, many kinds of uh, birds love to eat the sedge. Um, and I do have details for all these photos for growing conditions. If anybody wants any more information, they can touch base with me later. And on this note, I will turn it over to Dawn for trees and shrubs. Okay. Very good. Quickly, we have uh, just a few shrubs and, shrubs and trees that we're offering this year provided they come through from the State Forest Nursery of Iowa. I love this quote by Doug Douglas Tallamy with, uh, if you're at all interested in contribution to the conservation of local animals or in enjoying the wonders of nature right at home, planting one or more oaks is an awfully good way to do those things from his book, The Nature of Oaks. And uh, the burr oak is my, one of my favorite trees. It is the Iowa State tree and oaks are, are large trees. So if you don't have space for an oak, then don't plant an oak or consider if you plant an oak, you could also um, kind of lop it a little bit to, to prune it. What's that called? Cops, cop, coppicing it to make it a little bit shorter. Um, and to, because if you look at, if you take a hike up in the Lost Hills, the burr oak would continually get battered down by um, deer or by fires or whatever. So you get a little shorter scrubbier oak, but they still are oaks and provide a, a great uh, habitat. Another keystone species, more than 350 or what are more, as Sherry was talking about all the different caterpillars, a burr oak tree or any type of oak tree means life. And caterpillars mean life to, to hundreds of birds and all sorts of other um, animals throughout the whole food web. So again, it's a it's a mature tree. It gets up to 50 to 80 feet tall, the big spread, um, but it is a gorgeous drought tolerant tree. Um, in the fall, you're going to have the yellow brown colored leaves. And again, uh, if you're looking at pruning it, a lot of our native oaks are also are susceptible to um, some of the different oak wilt. And um, a tip would be to prune it during the dormant season to help avoid that. Um, here's one of our native oaks in Stone Park, just a spectacular, big, big, beautiful tree. So more of a shrub that you might consider is our native choke cherry. And uh, members in the Prunus genus um, are really a great uh, species to um, consider for caterpillar hosts. We have more than 250 butterflies and moths that really need the genus pr Prunus, which includes choke cherry, and the next one, the uh, wild plum. Um, again, we have numerous butterflies that'll that'll feed on those flowers, and they smell so good in the spring when they're blooming. Uh, they're going to be a cluster of a dro of droops that are going to be dangling, and you'll see them in the springtime. In uh, about uh, the flowers will bloom in in uh, late late May, early June, throughout June, and then you've got this droop of of dark cherry that come down. Um, choke cherry, as the name implies, they are bitter tasting. So uh, they, they're great for making jams and jellies with sugar, but if you try to eat them on their own, they also have a big pit, big droop. Um, but this kind of will show you a little bit more about what that tree would look like when it's um, or the shrubs. It can get kind of tall too, so you can also cut it back. Um, good wildlife cover, and you can also note the, the bark on that. Members of this um, genus also get a type of fungus called black knot fungus, which looks like when I would take kids on hike, they were like, what's that? It looks like dog poop on a stick. Well, yeah, yeah. it's a poop on a stick fungus. And, and it, if you get a lot of the fungus on there, it could be detrimental to your trees or shrubs. But for the most part, it, it, it's not overly harmful. It just looks kind of, it doesn't look real great, but um, you can also um, consider knowing that um, that's a good identifier. So you know you have a choke cherry or a wild plum. Um, the next next species is the wild plum. And uh, 
Many people that grew up in this area or in the Midwest are familiar with this tree. It's vital to so many different birds as far as habitat cover. It's a very dense shrub. Um, it does also, if you ever picked wild plums, it does have thorns, some pretty good thorns on those branches. So keep that in mind. Um, but uh, they have kind of a suckering root system. So they'll continue. This is a classic image of uh, wild plums in the spring. You'll see them blooming. Um, and I know that some people that I know of that have allergies say, oh, the wild plums are blooming, so I'm not allergic. But again, like Ruth said about goldenrod, wild plums, if you think about all the insects that are in them, they're not wind pollinated. They are insect pollinated. It's the elms that are blooming at the same time that are wind pollinated that you're allergic to. Not, not the wild plum. But anyway, they do smell beautiful, very fragrant, attract a lot of wildlife um, and so keep that in mind if you'd love to have. They also um, sometimes are planted in residential areas um, instead of like a crab tree. Um, edible fruit, good for jams and jelly. So another added bonus. Okay, another large tree, the hackberry is, is uh, one that you might consider. Look at that corky bark, very easy to identify. Um, it's uh, a member of uh, the, the, the family that, uh, that will get quite large, the, the, the base of the leaves are kind of asymmetrical. They're pretty easy to identify. And uh, they have um, a large spread up to 70 feet. They, it might grow, it likes well-drained soil, full sun in the fall, they're gonna be brilliant yellow. Um, and uh, you might consider planting them. We're getting a lot of ash trees that are being cut down. Don't just plant hackberry. Don't just plant one species, plant lots of different diverse species so we don't have the issues and the problems. But um, one thing about this plant, it also has a, um, a lot of times the leaves get a gall and they call them the um, nipple galls or the, um, they're, they're a type of little psyllid insect, kind of like a, a leaf hopper. So you see a lot of those little, Actually, you might be able to see it on the edge. There looks like there's a gall formed kind of on there, but literally a lot of the leaves sometimes will have those nipples on them. And that's that's an insect home, basically. So there's a little tiny insect egg in there that'll grow. Um, the berries themselves, they'll turn a darker purple black, big droop. There's not a fleshy fruit at all like the cherries, um, but they were very important um, historically for Native Americans. They would grind them up for like a pemmican um, or fruit leather. And it's host to the hackberry emperor, butterfly, question mark, American snout, and other insects. If you go out to Stone Park at Dorothy Pico Nature Center and the eruption time usually is, is mid to late June and the butterflies are everywhere. It's really pretty spectacular. So our final shrub is the nine bark. And this one is um, a beautiful little shrub that uh, can spread and sprawl a little bit. It's known um, by the interesting color of its bark, and it can also be kind of a winter interest, but those um, shrubs are good for wildlife, oops, excuse me, wildlife and cover. Um, this kind of gives a great, the top photo shows how it might present in your backyard. Again, you could cut it back and not have it be quite so um, large and, and uh, frond-like. Or um, again, the lower image shows again, some of the different variation of color that you might see on the leaves in the, in the late summer and early fall. And this is a picture of some of the seed, the red pot, the seed pots, which look a little different. It's not gonna get as tall, five to nine feet. It grows um, pretty, pretty quickly and uh, consider it as maybe a, a native shrub that you might want to have in your backyard or your, your uh, windbreak or your, farmstead, depending on where you live. So a uh, little bit more about the credits. I shared a little bit lo locally about those. Another good place that you might want to consider searching is on the National Wildlife Federation site, nwf.org, to find native plants, native plant finder. You can type in your zip code and, and see what kind of plants are in your native, native plants are in your area and what they benefit and how they might fit into your own situation. Finally, questions on this presentation about our plants that we featured today. Elisa wanted to point out that cardinal flower is a short for perennial, but Oh, thank you. One of our guests on Zoom, Lisa, noted that the cardinal flower is a short-lived perennial. It does recede. 
the um, I know the great flowered large flowered penstemon is also a um, a biennial. So you'll have the rosettes for the first year, and then you'll have the flower, and they also will recede too. So you want to continue to keep putting those seeds out if you want more of those beautiful flowers. Great. Any other interjections or questions? Will the plant list be posted on our website? Will the plant list be posted on the website? Yes, it will. And this uh, presentation will also be on our website. Once we have the times of the plant sale, that will be on there as well. And uh, so keep looking at lesshillswildones.org. Uh, and if you're on our e-blast, um, they'll be coming out in those areas too. Questions? Anyone else? Okay, I'm going to move on to let Marcy, Marcy Ponder, I'm going to introduce her. She's going to share more about the long-awaited pants. No, please not. Thank you, Don. Okay, who's excited about all the plants? I'm making notes back there. Okay, we have gone through numerous drafts of our grant uh, application. And some of our board members thought it was a little daunting, but I decided that's what we wanted. <laughs> um, I am. Well, we want to know that the applicants, especially the nonprofits, are enthusiastic and de determined to plant new areas of native plants in our area. So the first grant pro our, our first grant program is a $500 grant for nonprofit organizations within 75 miles of Sioux City. The grant is intended to provide organizations with a way of preparing, planting, and maintaining an area of natural landscaping with native plants. Projects that have an educational aspect, like a small butterfly garden, a little prairie area, or landscaping near a school or public building would be ideal. The second program is for Les Hills Wild Ones members only, and selected recipients of those will be awarded one flat of plants, these plants that you just saw, um, from our spring sale. And that's 32 plants. 32 plants in a flat. So do the math, one plant for every 12 inches, you can figure that out. Um, and members don't have to use these plants in their own landscapes. They, they can decide where they plant the plants, um, churches, schools, wherever. And back there, we have some print off grant, uh, grant forms that can be filled in by hand. We also have QR codes that will take you to an electronic form that you can fill out on the computer. Um, all the applications, both the members and the nonprofits are due on May 1st, and we will announce the winners or the recipients on May 10th. Let's see. Um, and we're just very excited about all the possibilities that getting new native landscapes in the area. This is really going to help that. Are there any questions? How many uh, grants are there per category? Oh, that's a good question. The nonprofit, we are doing five this spring, and then we'll do another round of five in the fall. And I think we decided on 10 for the members only grants, both, both times. <laughs> There's the answer. Oops. Screen share, never mind. Okay. But it is live on our website. It is live on our website. Any questions? Well, thank you for coming. I'm excited about the plants and the grants. And finally. Go back to this. Uh oh. Hi, friends. Well, the final slide is yet to be found. And it's about, it just shows our upcoming events, which 
Where'd it go? Where'd it go? Do you see it out there? Okay. There. there. So join us at upcoming events. Uh, next month, we'll be right here at the Sioux City Public Library with the Rain Gardens, Julie Perot at 2 p.m. on April 16th. And then we'll do a hike, wildflowers on the Fowler Forest hike. We, I will be leading that hike at uh, down at Fowler Forest Preserve, which is just uh, by Smithland, Iowa, off of Highway 141. And that's going to be at 10 a.m. on Saturday, May 6th. And we're working on our garden walk schedule. So in the back of the room, there's a uh, interested in if you want to host a garden walk um, and showcase your garden, let us know. Um, again, we're working on the dates and the sites for that, but it'll be June through September. We'll have some different garden walks and much more fun to come. So thank you for joining us today. We went a little over three. I hope that's not, not too bad for, for all of you. We do have some refreshments on there. And again, check out the back of the room. Thank you on Zoom land for joining us and uh, have a great rest of your Sunday.